your character and who you are, there's nothing wrong with it. And I wish I had someone say that, you know, but I think black girls, especially young black girls, they're not told enough that they are, that they are normal to the world. It's not, you're not abnormal. Hey everyone, welcome to She Brigade, the podcast. I'm your host, Belundle Musimere. On this podcast, we bring you amazing trailblazing women to come and share their life and career journeys with you. From entrepreneurs to 95ers, join us as each guest takes you through all of the highs and all the lows of their journeys that have led them to being who they are today. We're back. We are back, you guys. I'm so glad to be back with all of you for season three of the podcast. You know, the journey of creating and sharing this podcast has been absolutely incredible. And I'm so glad that I get to share it with all of you. Guys, 2020 has been a wild year. (laughs) And that's probably putting it mildly. And it's certainly nothing that anybody could have predicted. So thank you to all of you listening for always standing with us. So here is to more amazing stories. Without any further delays, let us jump right into season three. Today's guest is Ndoni Nguni. Ndoni is a climate scientist and social entrepreneur. She has been internationally recognized as a leader in climate change and sustainable energy. Ndoni is currently pursuing her PhD at the Global Change Institute at Wits University. She received so many awards, including but definitely not limited, to being named one of 40 under 40 African leaders for climate resilience in in 2019 by Walton Park, an executive agency of the UK Foreign Office. Over and above all of her work as a climate and energy advocate, she's also the founder of Black Women in Science, a registered non-profit organization that aims to deliver capacity development interventions that target young black women scientists and researchers. I cannot wait for you all to hear her story as a scientist, academic, and international climate activist. Let's dive in. So, Ndoni, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on the show, uh, Pelo. It's an honestly such an honor to be here today. I, I'm, I feel like it's an honor to have you on the show. You've done so much, and you've also done so much in, in a field that is, I feel like... Um, in terms of popularity, it's, 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 it's so everybody's talking about climate change right now. And you've been in this field for so long and you've been doing <laughs> such, such amazing work for it for so long. So I'm very curious to know how you got into this field, especially as like, I feel like as a, as a young black woman, it's not something that people are like, oh, climate change. Let me, let me do something in that field when I grow up. So I'm very excited to hear your journey and your story. Mm. So um, climate change is fairly new um, in the environmental science field. And so I really got into it through my interest and in my research. I grew up in a suburb and um, Uma is from Mtualume, which is at the time it was very green. And I would see my grandma kind of doing some little small scale farming And that would be interesting for me to understand the system that was in my daily life. And so Mm -hmm. one of the days I took a drive with my uncle um, and my aunt and Cornelia. And at that time, I was just trying to figure out what is it that I love. And we're driving through Sidara, which is an agricultural um, college in Marisbeck. And when we're driving through that, we stopped... um, at one of these small restaurants and we had a strawberry milkshake and there the milkshake was straight from the garden. <clears throat> ah. And I thought, what on earth, you know, I'm used <laughs> to a strawberry milkshake that you go to Wimpy or you go to Mag and Bean and you order a strawberry milkshake. And he has this whole other life where you order it and they, you see them picking it from the actual garden. And, and then I really started to get interested in the natural environment. And through me getting to understand the natural environment, climate change is obviously a topic that is um, part of the environment and sustaining the environment and how we treat the environment. And then I got into it in my postgraduate qualifications. So, okay. So 
I just want to rewind a little bit and I want to know, so when you were in high school, because, you know, in high school, we need to pick our subjects, no, we need to pick our, sorry, degrees um, in terms of like what we're going to study in university. What did you think you were going to be then? Oh, gosh, I wanted to do, <laughs> I went through medicine. Um, I wanted to be a doctor, a medical doctor. And then I realized I'm actually um, kind of scared of blood. <laughs> and also I wasn't the I wasn't the greatest at maths. <laughs> so um I I then kinda lost interest in, in medicine. Then I went into the bios. Um I was really interested in microbiology. And then after that I I um I got interested in actuary, which is actually studying fishes, because I really loved jellyfish jellyfish. I thought jellyfish was so interesting. Oh, like wow. even if you look at them, they they they're weird. And so um, I wanted to understand that. Then, yeah, so I was, all, then I got interested into the whole bio side of life. And, and that's how, you know, I got into it. Oh my goodness. Like, I'm not even going to lie to you. I, I did not enjoy the sciences in high school at all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of us did. I, to be honest, I don't think anybody was like, wow, you know, I'm thriving. I love this. Yeah. I think it was just, you know, it was just, oh, well, people say I need it. I think science, when you get into post, I'm um, not post-grad, sorry, when you get into out of high school into your undergrad, that's when you start really understanding what is science. You know? when Otherwise, you, when you're still learning, like, you know, the yeah. structure of whatever, oh, I don't know. It's not that it's not that interesting. Yeah, probably because, like, of application. Like, the application of it doesn't mm. really translate when you're, when you're mm. still that young. Okay, so so then, um, so you went to varsity. So what did, you, what did you study and where did you go and how was your varsity career? Okay, so I went to Rhodes and I... And I did microbio and I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> and so then I changed and I took a gap year and I figured myself out. And then I went to UKZN and I studied um, environmental sciences. And yeah, then I went from, from my undergrad and then I went to my, to my master's. And then I, from there, after my master's, I came to do my PhD at Wits University. Mm, and and what would you say was the main driver for you to like throughout your journey to and because I feel like not a lot of people study all the way up to PhD. Um, they, not even a lot of people study up the, all the way to their masters. Um, what was the main driver for you to feel that you need to study um, all the way up to your PhD, just in general throughout your journey? You know, Bella, I'd love to be this inspiring person who has this amazing story about that decision. But I would also like to be honest about it. And I think mm -hmm. it's important to be honest in the sense that um, research and academia, I don't think people, a lot of people don't understand it. I know in my family, I'm going to be the first to graduate with a PhD, meaning mm -hmm. that nobody really understands what it means to be in research and academia. And so... I would love to say I, it was an intentional decision where from undergrad, I was like, I want to be in research and academia. I want to do my PhD. And I always say, I always speak about how I fell into, um, in quotation, you know, um, mm. words, you know, I fell into academia and I fell into it in the sense that after my undergrad, you know, there was money for me to do my honors. Then there was money for me to do my master's. And then, you know, it was like, why not do your PhD? Because you're still young, you know, and you don't have that many responsibilities right now in your life. And so it wasn't an, it wasn't an intentional decision. Mm -hmm. And that is actually frustrating when you, when you get into a, when you get into the role that I am in now, knowing that this is the path that I've chosen, but I wasn't aware, you know, mm. something gets stolen from it. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of, a, it's a big question and a lot of solutions and answering, you know, then how do we solve this? Uh, it's, it's a generational thing to look at the stats around black academics, you know, I think at UCT, they have 15 black professors, not 15 mm. percent, one five. Yeah. And so that speaks around communication around research and academia. And so you, you can't blame me or other academics coming along that just decide to do their PhD and not really understanding what it means for you to do your PhD and, and what career choice you make. 
So I would love to say, you know, I was inspired and I did this. No, it was just, it was an opportunity. And if you look into the the stats and the, the policies around Africa, South Africa, the Department of Science and Innovation uh, um, white paper, one of its main goals is to promote black professorship. And post-apartheid, it's been to promote black academics, black professorship. And so you find yourself in the statistics, but not really understanding what it means for you. And that mm-hmm. is a conversation that is, um, that, that, that's a conversation I work on as a, a, in Black Women in Science, yeah. my organization. Yeah. Yeah, as you were speaking, I was about to ask, is, the, is that the reason why you started uh, Black Women in Science? Yes, yes, definitely. It's the reason. Um, I was recently interviewed by the Ocean Woman, the UCT department. Um, Ocean Woman has less than, I think, even 1% Black, black females mm-hmm. in it at UCT. So it's an incredible initiative that is being done at UCT to try to promote more Black women in oceanography. Anyway, so then they asked me, why did I start Black Women in Science? And I, you know, as I was answering the question, I understood why. So Black Women in Science for me is obviously a personal journey in that mm-hmm. I saw these kind of problems. And I said, but should I do my PhD? And I looked around, not even PhD, should I do my master's? And I looked around Bello, and there was nobody to advise me. You know, mm-hmm. I, I couldn't have access. I didn't know where to go. Uh, I, I had been studying for how many years? Like nine years when you do your master's and never been lectured by a black female. Yeah. And and that's that's just crazy. And so you do these decisions in a way, you know. And so I was like, should I do my PhD? Should I do my master's? And and you really don't think about mentorship and the importance of it. And, and so... During my journey, I realized that, no, there needs to be a network of women. And we speak about these industries, research industries. Um, The fact that most of us black women or some of us in the science industry really want to also see ourselves in in a business aspect. So we provide business and entrepreneurship training, uh, communication. How do we communicate our science and how do we write and publish as, as, um, as young scientists? And these are all skills that are not conventional to your to your uh, daily sciences, to ones to, uh, or not even just your conventional sciences, but in how science is taught at university level. It's, you know, stay in your lab and, and do your research. And these scientists and the emerging scientists now are saying, um, you know, we want to get ourselves into business. We want to be CFOs. We want to be CEOs. We want to, you know, be directors. Mm-hmm. And how do we get into these positions? And so that's what we do as an organization. And and what do you see that the impact has been so far with Black Women in Science? I've seen a high interest in it. And I've been asking myself a lot, why this interest? Um, mm. Why is it? So we do a needs analysis, a survey where we ask if we had to provide you with some kind of skills, what kind of skills would you want? And the highest skill that women want is business and entrepreneurship. These are scientists. And I asked myself this question, why do we want business and entrepreneurship? And I actually think that it's interesting because what's happening is the stats around science and women have been mostly white male and white women. The background of those people um, is different to the background of black people. Black people are growing up in families where you are the sole breadwinner you are the first of many in your house. So, you, you know, so what that does is it creates this hunger in you that you want more and you want more and you need to work harder and you need to, you know, invest more. And mm-hmm. then you have these kind of women and these kind of individuals coming into the academic sector and the academic sector is not designed for that. So then it becomes confusing for them. It's like, wait a minute, but this can't be it. I need to understand myself in a business sector. I need to understand myself. In, and it's because of our background and where we come from and our yeah. desire and our pressures and our pushes. And now we are saying as women, as scientists, as academics, we want more. And this is all the women, this is all that women want. And that's why the interest in black women in science has been that in the sense of these women want more. We want to be more than just scientists. We want to mm-hmm. influence, we want to change we want to earn different um, uh, um, avenues of income. 
and and black women in science is trying to bring all of these women together and trying to structure how can we influence science to being ma- more tailor made for black academics and black mm. women scientists yeah mm, mm. like you know as you were speaking i've had quite a number of guests come on to the show and they speak about how they are first generation entrepreneurs and it's interesting because, you know, we often hear about first generation graduates or first generation professional, like um, people that are in corporate settings in terms of black people specifically.